Good afternoon, please, Mr. Putin, Anton Bernitsky, Channel 1. Are you satisfied with the efficiency of SEO in such a turbulent situation in the world? And is the SEO up to all the challenges? Yes, indeed, it's a very useful organization. Let me remind you that it was created to finally settle all the issues left after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The borderline issues with the Chinese Republic, People's Republic of China, that remained unresolved between the new sovereign states and China. And gradually this organization started gaining momentum. And in today's world, it has become very relevant because it's obviously one of the independent centers of the new multipolar world. And this is what attracts participants, member states of the organization and those who want to maintain contacts on most different levels. As guests and as observers, and the desire to join the organization is growing, and the organization has indeed become a global organization. Almost half of the world's population are live in the countries in the member states of the SCO. And besides, it's a platform for coordinating positions among member states, it's, there's China, Brazil, India and Pakistan, and there's no such thing as too many contacts. And since the organization has become so big and powerful, and the principles it declares also matter when they are distributed all over the world. In our declaration, we agreed that all SEO member countries are against deploying any weaponry in outer space. This is a signal for the rest of the world regarding how we treat the militarization of outer space. There are other things that are serious and important and, well, trillions in commodity turnover. That's something to, to reckon. That's something to consider. As I said before, 5.4 or 5.3% of GDP growth and 4.5% of industrial manufacturing with low inflation of 2.4% is, is great growth rate for economy and good quality of it, I mean low level of inflation. And we also coordinate on humanitarian issues and cooperate in various areas like youth, education and sports. All this is very important and has great <coughs> perspectives. Alexander Gamov, Komsomolska Pravda. We have already made statements that we consider Rada the only legitimate authority in Ukraine. That's how it is in the Constitution. Well, maybe Russia could address uh, Rada directly, the Ukrainian parliament, maybe for the people of Ukraine and the West, for everyone to hear this, this direct call. In December 1999, there was a decision was made to create a union state between Russia and Belarus with a single currency and so on and so on. And now integration processes are unprecedented considering our defense ties. Do you think it's time to get back to creating this union that seemed relevant back in 1999? Well, addressing the Rada directly is possible, of course, but amid usurpation of power by the ruling regime, 
it's it makes no sense because most of the rudder obeys this well, regime that this unlawful regime that doesn't even apply to the constitutional court to reaffirm their authority back in 2015 the supreme court of ukraine ruled that presidential term in Ukraine is limited at five years and there are no other reasons to prolong presidential authority under the constitution of Ukraine. So all the authority should go to Rada, but it won't take this authority. Well, of course, we can address them, but... I think this makes no sense seeing what is actually happening here. And as for the Union State, it develops. And we remember all the goals and tasks stated in the founding documents. And this is the path we are going along, and the President of Belarus thinks, and I support him in that, that on the first phase, we need to address matters not of political nature, but of economic nature. We need to create the foundation, the base, for to get closer on the political track. In politics, we are doing very well. We, were, we have interparliamentary structures and intergovernmental structures. And whether we need to move to a single parliament, I think it's a matter of time. I agree with Mr. Lukashenko that first we need to strengthen our economic relations. The same applies to finances and single currency. Nobody is saying that it's impossible or cannot be done. We just we just need the situation to be ripe for that. Take the European Union, for example, where states with weak economy, a lot of them suffered when Euro was introduced, because they can't regulate anything using inflation, because everything is begged to Euro, so Greece couldn't regulate its inner economic processes when Euro was in place. I think we have made very serious headway in this direction. This applies to tax regulation, customs regulation, and these things are, well, nothing short of revolutionary. When we are going forward, considering international experience, and I think we are doing the, the right thing, Russia today, please. Terrorist organizations in territory of Afghanistan are considered a serious threat to the security of SEO countries, and the Islamic State is considered one of the most serious of them. The question is, do we need to involve the Taliban to the dialogue about terrorist threats? Do you think they are our allies or enemies in, in this? Well, the, the Taliban movement has taken on certain obligations, and in general there are issues that require constant attention, both inside the country and in the international community, but in general, we need to take, keep in mind the fact that Taliban controls power in their country and in this regard Taliban are our allies in fighting terrorism because any current power, any incumbent power is in cares for the stability of the state it rules and I'm sure that the Taliban is interested that everything in Taliban is t stable and obeys certain rules. And we have repeatedly received signals from Taliban that they are ready to work with us on the anti-terrorist track. 
Thank you. Izvestia, newspaper. So Afghanistan remains an observer with the SCO. And in Kabul, the authorities have repeatedly said that they're interested in becoming a full-scale member of the organization. Is this being discussed with the SCO? Especially considering that the contact group is working already. Is Russia considering taking Taliban off the list of banned organization? Well, as I said, we are in contact with the Taliban movement. We have recently re repeatedly received signals that Taliban is ready to cooperate with us on many tracks, including anti-terrorist track. But as, as for full-scale membership in the SEO, it's not up to Russia alone. It's always decided on consensual base and there are issues with different member countries of the SCO and that has to do with the inclusivity of power in Afghanistan I think I think we need to maintain our relationship with Afghanistan with the real political structures that control the power in, in the country we will continue doing that and I see no reasons why we should turn away from this. And as for the exact timeline, that will depend on the situation. Pavel Zarubin, Russia TV channel. A couple months ago, I managed to ask a question to you. Who is better to us, Biden or Trump? And you said Biden. But it turns out right now that this bet is well, questionable because after the recent debates in the USA, everybody is shocked by Biden and his presidential run is, is now a doubted. What are your impressions from presidential debates in the US? Have your preferences changed? You said this bet is questioned now. Well, nothing is questioned, I think. What has changed? Nothing has. We have always known what could happen. And as for whether I watched the debates, no, I saw some pieces. Well, I have plenty on my plate. I didn't look much especially comments in the mass media. They always have their preferences and their agendas. Well, in general, yes, sure, I am aware of what's going on. I never looked away from that. The United States remains a great power with certain capabilities in military power, and security, and the United States is a permanent member of the Security Council. And of course, I pay attention to what is, go, to what is going on there, but it's their domestic matter. Speaking of uh, Donald Trump's statement made during the debates, he says he's ready to end the conflict in Ukraine in one day. There are also rumors that Trump may stop NATO's expansion to the east. How seriously do you take these statements, promises? Well, you know, the fact that Mr. Trump, as a presidential candidate, says that he's ready and wants to stop the war in Ukraine, we take that very seriously. Well, I, I haven't seen his ideas on how exactly he's going to do that, and that is the key question. But I have no doubt that he says that sincerely, and we support that. Andrei Kolesnikov, Kormersan. Mr. Putin, do you think a ceasefire in Ukraine is possible before the beginning of peace talks without any preliminary conditions just to improve any chances for success or is it a matter of negotiations as well? well let me remind you some things when our troops were standing near Kiev our Western partners asked us insistently to stop hostilities 
to give Ukraine time to do certain things, and we did just that. The Ukrainian part never seized hostilities, and later we were told that Ukrainian officials cannot control all of their armed forces because there are certain armed units that do not obey the central power. This is what we were told. I didn't invent anything. Then we were asked to withdraw our troops to make conditions for, for a peace settlement. We did that and then we were deceived and all the Stambul agreements went down the drain. And this happened many times, so right now just announcing a ceasefire, hoping that the other party may take some positive steps, we just can't do that. Besides, we can't afford to have a situation that the enemy could use the ceasefire to improve their position to do some more mobilization, to draft more troops, to arm them and be ready to continue the armed conflict. We need, we need to make the other parties take steps that would be irreversible and would be acceptable for the Russian Federation. So a ceasefire without agreement is impossible. Just recently Vladimir Zelensky said he considers negotiations with Russia possible through a middleman, as it was with the grain deal. We have always been in favor of peace talks. We've never shunned from them. The question is that finally settling the conflict through middle people, I think it's it's hardly feasible because there is little chance that the middlemen will have the authority to f sign the final documents and not only sign them but to lead the parties to signing them. It's a matter of not only competency of those middlemen but their authorities as well. Who can give a middle person the authority to put put an end to this conflict. I think this is hardly possible. Well, however, the way Mr. Erdogan did this during our talk negotiations process in Istanbul, well, we welcome that. Zvezda TV channel. What do we know about Washington's plans to deploy small and medium range, short and medium range missiles? Just recently you talked about the need to start manufacturing new short and middle range missile systems. Well, due to the U.S. withdrawal from this treaty and news that they are beginning production of short and medium range missiles, we consider ourselves authorized to start research and development work and production of similar missiles and as for deployment of such systems, if you remember, I said that we declare a moratorium on deployment of our systems until such missile complexes show up in certain regions of the world. And if short and medium range missiles, American missiles appear somewhere, we reserve the right to act accordingly. Alexander Yunushev, live. Just recently you had a whole series of bilateral meetings and a lot of attention was focused on your meeting with Erdogan. 
the, 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 tr the turnover is already growing, although not as fast as we would like. What do you think is the biggest challenge in Russian-Turkish relationships? What stands in the way? Well, we know very well what stands in the way, and what helps us is Erdogan's political will. Well, in, in the political plane, it's settlements. Just recently, our Turkish partners said that our trade turnover went down from 63 billion to 55 billion, but they think that it has to do with the pricing and cost characteristics because they bought our oil and gas at higher prices and over the recent months uh, prices fell down, especially in comparison with the year 2022. According to them, the, the volume of trade turnover remains roughly the same. Well, I'll look into that, but I think the main issue is about intensifying, boosting our work. Both parties are interested in this, and there are, well, objective things. It's not that something is standing in our way. It just has to do with the natural things like good harvests, grain harvests in Turkey. So Turkey now buys less grain or tax limitations related to our metal industry. This has nothing to do with any external limitations. It's just the dynamic of internal manufacturing and our bilateral relationships. So, Mir Channel. Now that Belarus is an official member of the SCO, what prospects does it give to the organization and what opportunities open between the SCO and the Eurasian Economic Union? Well, Belarus, of course, cannot be compared to China or India in its scale or population, but still it's an important element of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization because Belarus is part of Eastern Europe and it's an official expansion of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to the European continent and to Belarus it's a great advantage because through Russia and then through Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, it has access, now gains access to the Caspian Sea and then to Iran. And that's important for Belarus as it remains a major exporter of mineral fertilizers and it matters what routes it used, uses to supply its fertilizers and to what countries they can supply their agricultural machines. So I think it's a mutually beneficial decision and to a great degree it's a success of Alexander Lukashenko in his Ministry of Foreign Affairs. <coughs> Interfax Agency. So basically the previous strategic stability system has been obsolete with all missile treaties basically non-existent. Do you think these treaties may be renewed in the future or maybe it makes sense to come up with something new like a single concept or convention or any other framework document? And on what platform you think this should be discussed? Well, first, I'd, the first thing I'd like to point out is indeed the foundational documents that used to underpin the international system of security and safety were destroyed by the United States. It's not us who withdrew out of the missile defense treaty or the short and medium range missile treaty. There are many elements that used to be to lie in the foundation of the international stability system. 
were destroyed over the last few years. And it wasn't us who have done that. The United States has done it. We only had to, we, we could only respond to that. So in, in the military sphere, to overcome the United States missile defense system, we came up successfully with the uh, air defense breach systems like avant-garde missiles with uh, hypersonic warheads and air defense breach systems on intercontinental ballistic missiles. So we were forced to do that, but still the matter of creating a legal framework for international security and strategic stability, it's still on the table. They, well, then as for new agreements, we're getting back to old ones, I think that's up to specialists. Well, when I was studying in the university, I majored in international private law. And I wrote some diploma thesis on that. It's not even about the formal legal part, it's about the, the essence of the matters we have to solve together. We formulated our propositions. I talked about that in my speech in the Minister of Foreign Affairs. But there has to be goodwill on the part of those who are interested in this. So we've been listening, we've been hearing from the United States that they want to resume talks about that. But some one day they won't, one day, one day they don't. During Obama administration, we were told that they want to start talking and then suddenly they didn't want to talk anymore. Now, during this very fierce election campaign, I think we can't say that we can establish some constructive dialogue with the United States. Everybody with the, even the slightest idea of what's going on realizes that it's impossible. We need to wait till the election in the US is complete. We need to understand the preferences of the future administration. We are ready for that. During your speech in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you said that these papers, that these ideas will be put on paper. Will those be some written propositions to the West? Are there any contacts going on regarding your propositions regarding Ukraine? Well, as for international security, I just said we need to wait till the new administration appears. We'll need to see their preferences, their views, their plans, and whether they are willing at all to be talking about this. We've been receiving certain signals from time to time that they want to resume this dialogue and then they just disappear again and start talking about different things totally unrelated to strategic stability. Once again, I say, let's see. Let's wait till the new administration is formed and then we will understand their plans and preferences. We are ready for that. Thank you.